Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, and I'm bummed. Why am I bummed? Because I just reviewed a very, very good recording. Actually, it's still sitting here. Wait a minute. Let me, let me pull it out of its little slot. Here it was. Uh, CPE Bach's The Hamburg Symphonies. Hamburg Symphonies, you want to call that on Glossa, uh, with the Orchestra of the, of the 18th Century, featuring Alexander Janicek conducting. And it was very, very good. It really is. It's quite fine. So I recommend that, that accordingly. And one of you, of course, chimed in immediately and said, well, they've also released um, Boccherini Symphonies, his Opus 35, the Six Symphonies, Opus 35, which are lovely works. I enjoy them enormously. And, you know, because I've got the complete Boccherini Symphonies on CPO under Johannes Goritsky, which we may talk about if we haven't already. I don't even remember. But I have it. And you said, oh, are you going to cover that too? And I said, sure, I will. I have it sitting here. Haven't had a chance to listen to it. So I did. I played it a couple times. Here it is. It's with the Orchestra of the 18th Century. Um, but it's under uh, Marc Destrube. Yes, Destrube, the leader. He's the leader, the string guy. Um, you know, you don't really conduct it so much as you 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 nudge it and poke it with, you know, and do this and this and wave your armpits around and, you know. Anyway, this pissed me off. Totally. It is a very well-played disc, nicely played, but completely misconceived. I mean misconceived in so many ways, it's sort of hard to list them all. But I'm going to do it anyway. It's my job. Why is it misconceived? Okay. First of all, these were composed in 1782. So it's rather late in the classical period. We're in the mature classical period. Um, and this is during the time when Boccherini was in Spain and he was hanging out with the Infanta, you know, the brother of the king. And so he was exiled and he was in a castle somewhere, you know, in, in, in the wide outskirts of Madrid. And he was stuck there for like 10 years writing music for this guy. And he wrote millions of chamber works and quintets. He wanted to write some symphonies. A lot of his earlier symphonies and the symphonies were written for, um, what's his name? You know, what's his name? Frederick the Great. That was the guy. Um, and, and uh, you know, but then eventually Frederick got tired of him and I don't know what happened. Anyway, Boccherini was a wonderful composer. His style was like nobody else's. And one of the things that pisses me off about Boccherini's other things, lots of things piss me off about the way Boccherini is treated, is that his style is regarded as pre-classical or, or somehow immature because it's not like what Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven were doing. Now, when Haydn, Mozart, or Beethoven did something that was not like what everyone else was doing, everyone said they were geniuses. But if someone like Boccherini does it because he's isolated in Spain, you know, everyone says, well, it's Boccherini, it's Italian, it's not German, it's not that, it's, it's, you know, all the, all the bullshit starts oozing. I don't mean oozing, it starts gushing. I mean gushing. You know, Haydn said, I was trapped at Esterhaza and so I had to become original. And everyone says, ah, the word of power, he was a genius, and he was, and he was original. Boccherini was trapped in a castle somewhere outside Madrid, and he had to become original, and everyone considers that somehow a fault. And I just can't stand the double standard. It makes me so angry. And that's why this makes me angry. Boccherini's symphonies and other works are not so well known that we can afford to misrepresent them. Now, the Opus 35 symphonies were composed for an orchestra of strings, two oboes, two horns, and bassoon. That's the ensemble. Originally, they were written possibly as quintets, possibly, um, you know, for single people to a part, and the wind parts are ad libitum. He added them later because he wanted to perform them by every composer of the period with as large an ensemble as he could possibly get his hands on and as colorful an ensemble. And with Boccherini, that is particularly important because Boccherini was not a line guy. He was a chord guy. He was interested in texture, in sonority, in, in making beautiful, sensuous sounds. I mean, his, his handling of string writing alone is exquisite. He often divides up his string parts. So what do these people do? They, they ignore the wind parts. They play them without wind parts. And they're not so ad libitum that everything that these, the wind parts do is completely um, dependent on the strings supporting them at all costs. They don't. They have limited independence in 
various musical lines and places, and they contribute incomparably to the color of the piece. And their use is is like everything Boccherini did. It's exquisite. It's beautifully, beautifully gauged to make everything sound just as fabulous as it possibly can. So they leave out the wind parts. And they don't, of course, do them one string to a part because they've discovered, apparently, that there were multiple parts written for each each of the symphony, a quattro, four voiced strings. Um, so that means that there were multiple strings to a part. So they've done it with like four violins and, and four, four first, four seconds, three cellos, two basses, you know, two thirds of a something, um, which is, I mean, there's no evidence they were played that way. Um, I mean, they need to be played with more strings, but it's still too few. It's too few to bring out the richness of texture and the dynamic range, because these Boccherini was incredibly detailed in his score markings. I mean, he, he, his dynamics are, are pinpoint precise. And so you want to have a wide dynamic range so that you can bring out the range of dynamics. And formally, these pieces are so interesting. I mean, because, you know, he, he's, some start with slow movements, some start with quick movements, some have finales with minuets folded into them. I mean, each symphony is different. And each one has its own sort of formal gambit to pursue. I mean, they're, they're brilliant and wonderful and inventive and consistently entertaining. But you want there to be contrast and to make sure everything sounds as absolutely monochrome as possible after doing all of this, 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 these mental gymnastics to justify leaving out the wind parts and, and instead, you know, only doing it with minimal string forces, playing them with minimal string forces, what do they do? They add a continuo, which Boccherini does not call for. I mean, he's very specific. He tells you how many parts, he tells you what instruments, he writes it all on the title page, you know, it's, it's, these are ad libitum. It's not plus continuo, of course not, because, well, nobody wrote down that you needed a continuo, you just do it. But by 1782, I mean, if you listen to Haydn's symphonies of those periods, we're coming up to the Paris symphonies, you, you did not need a continuo. It's not whether one was used, because orchestras were often conducted in those days from the keyboard. We don't know exactly what people did from the keyboard. For example, example, Haydn in his London symphonies conducted them from the keyboard. Remember, he wrote that tiny little little keyboard solo at the end of his 98th symphony, which is a joke, of course. It's a joke because otherwise he would have done nothing. That's the whole point. You know, the, the guy who was sitting at the keyboard, well, maybe if he knew the whole thing, he could fill in if the orchestra broke down or something needed, needed fixing. You know, but basically, the reason that Haydn sat at the keyboard is because his concerts were not merely orchestral concerts. They featured chamber music. They featured arias accompanied by piano. They featured pianists playing, you know, variations on tunes people would shout out from the audience. You needed to have a keyboard. That doesn't mean it was used all the time. And it doesn't mean that it was used in orchestral works that did not require it. And it particularly isn't required in works by composers who were incredibly, incredibly gifted chord guys who cared about texture and sonority and were very, very careful about what forces they wrote for. And Boccherini took great care to make sure that those forces were completely self-sufficient. You don't need a continuo. So here's a performance that leaves out the things that Boccherini said he wanted, but includes things that he never said he wanted. And all, by the way, by way of insisting that this is authentic, that this is historically informed. I mean, it's just so freaking stupid. And, and these symphonies need to be performed in their most glamorous, sexy, persuasive way. Not as these little, tiny, throw-off, diminutive, diminutive, what's the word? I know it begins with a D. Uh, these, 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 these small scale, uninteresting, harpsichordically monochrome with a clanging keyboard going through the lights. It's all so wrong in so many ways. And so I was disgusted by this set and I am just furious at the, the, the orchestra of the 18th century and Mark Destrube for thinking 
that by doing this, however well played it, well, it is, and it's very well played, that they were doing justice to this composer, to this music. I mean, don't they have ears? Can't they hear what this music needs? It needs its wind parts. It needs larger string sections. It needs some kind of textural awareness on the part of the people who are performing. And there's none here. So, to hell with it. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.